Hello Ignite, it's Miss Christine here, and I want to thank you so much for pressing play and spending some time with me in God's Word, learning about Jesus together. As most of you know, when I first got to Grace, I was an intern. And as you might know, interns don't make a lot of money. Now, I wasn't really nervous about that until I got to Grace and I realized just how often I was going to be eating out in order to build relationships with others and meet people. Between lunch meetings and coffee dates and dinner get-togethers, I started to get really nervous. I couldn't afford to eat out this much as an intern. And each meeting on my calendar meant that I would be dishing out 10 to $15 just for one meal, when I was used to spending $50 a week on groceries. But as I started to meet people in this church community for these meals, something incredible happened. People that invited me to these lunches or dinners or coffees said, order whatever you want, I got you. And every time someone would cover me, I'd say something like, thanks, I'll pay you back, or I've got you next time. And almost every time that person would say, no need to pay me back, you're good. To this day, I still remember that. I was a poor intern who couldn't afford to eat out. And these awesome people, many people that are probably watching this video right now, picked up my tab without asking for any sort of payback. Not asking to be paid back is kind of heartwarming when it comes to paying for someone else's food. But other times, it can be kind of complicated. Outside of paying money back to someone you owe, the idea of payback also comes up when someone hurts us. For example, when someone talks about us behind our back, we want payback. When someone flirts with our girlfriend or boyfriend, we want payback. When someone fails to text us back or invite us to a group outing, we want payback. And in those moments when we've been hurt, we want payback. Okay, so maybe you don't go all scary movie and get terrifying revenge or write a song about them, but we all try to get payback in one way or another. We want them to feel the pain and hurt we felt because of them. We want them to be embarrassed the way we were embarrassed. Our first reaction is almost always to get even. That's the sinful nature inside of us. We want to get something in return, even if it's just knowing our shady Snapchat comment was actually about them. And isn't it true that the closer we are to a person, the more we want payback? Most of you aren't trying to pay back someone else's brother or sister, are you? Your feelings probably aren't hurt because of someone else's best friend. And you probably aren't angry because of what someone else's ex did, are you? See, the people who are closest to you and the people who know you the best have the most potential to hurt you. It's a scary but true fact. So they're the most likely people to be on the list of people who owe you a payback. For most of us, payback comes in one of three ways. There's public payback. This is when we do to them what they did to us in an obvious way. We want to talk bad about the person who talked bad about us. We clap back loudly or we roast them and then we say just kidding like that covers it. Or there's passive payback. This way is way more subtle. We make comments that aren't obviously hurtful but could be interpreted that way. We put that subtle post on social media. We roll our eyes when someone talks or we ignore someone else's texts. And then there's imaginary payback. Personally, I'm kind of an expert at this kind and I'm not proud of it. Imaginary payback happens when we have an argument in our mind and we destroy them. We have a better argument, a better comeback, and we annihilate them. It takes over our thoughts, but we never actually do anything against them. And then there's perhaps the most satisfying payback of all enjoying watching them fail. Like when our ex broke up with us for someone else and then he or she got dumped. Or when our mom snapped at us and hurt our feelings and now she's crying and apologizing. It's the perfect setup for us to put an explanation mark on her regret. Or that guy who made fun of us in third grade and we for real still hate him face plants during a pep rally game. 
You know what I'm talking about. In those moments, it feels like justice got served, doesn't it? It feels good to see someone get what's coming to them, whether that's good or whether that's bad. And that is exactly the sort of situation Joseph found himself in as we wrap up his story tonight. In this series, we've been journeying through the life of Joseph, whose story is found in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. And his story is a wild one, one where oftentimes he had no idea what to do next. Early in this series, we talked about how Joseph knew he was his dad's favorite son, and he rubbed it in all of his brother's faces. Joseph also had dreams where he was in charge of the whole family, and then he told his older brothers about it. <laughs> Not exactly the most self-aware guy, am I right? And since Joseph was super annoying, his brothers plotted to kill him, which seems like a slight overreaction in my head. But instead, they saw a group traveling through town and they decided to make a little money by selling Joseph as a slave, which I guess is better than killing him. The rest of this series has covered Joseph as a slave in Egypt, then Joseph as a slave in prison in Egypt, and then Joseph as a man who interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, who was the ruler of all of Egypt. And because of that, Joseph was eventually placed in charge of all of Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh himself. It's really not a bad outcome for a kid who was sold into slavery by his brothers. But then there's a plot twist. Not surprising for this kind of story, right? After Joseph was second in command, there was a food shortage where his family lived. So Joseph's dad, Jacob, sent the brothers to Egypt to ask for food because their country was out of food and they were starving. At this point in the story, Joseph's family thought he was dead. So of course, they weren't even thinking about the possibility of seeing Joseph when they went to Egypt to ask for food. When they arrived in Egypt and saw Joseph, not knowing it was Joseph, a huge drama unfolded, huge family drama. You can read some of the interactions between Joseph and his brothers in Genesis chapters 42 through 50. Trust me, you don't wanna miss it. Seriously, read those chapters. Reading through the back and forth, knowing the backstory is like being in a movie. It's really fascinating. So get your Bibles open, and we're gonna actually pick this up in Genesis chapter 45, verses one through three. It says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried. Make everyone go out for me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept out loud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Wow, so this is dramatic, right? This is the reunion between Joseph and his brothers. Imagine the tension and emotion of that moment. Joseph was face to face with the people who tried to kill him, his own brothers who sold him into slavery, the same brothers who ironically were asking him for help. This was a get what's coming to you moment at its finest. Everything had been perfectly set up for payback. Payback was dropped in Joseph's lap. Joseph could have refused them food. Even worse, he could have had them thrown in prison and maybe give them a taste of their own medicine. He could have even had them killed. They were certainly willing to do that to him, weren't they? Okay, pause. What would you do if you were Joseph in this moment? I mean, you don't have to say it out loud, but in your own head, be honest with yourself. What would you have done with all that power to hurt the people who had hurt you the most? Honestly, I don't know. As the story continues, Joseph asked his brothers to walk over and stand close to him. You can imagine the terror the brothers felt in this moment, knowing that Joseph had the power to kill them right there on the spot. This is in uh, Genesis chapter 45, verses four through seven. Joseph responded, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land 
these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Whew. Now there's only one reason that Joseph could have responded the way he did. He didn't try to get payback because he had already let go of the idea of revenge. He had already done the hard work of forgiveness. How do we know that? Because Joseph could look in the eyes of the ones who had caused him the most grief, the most pain, and care about how they were feeling. When Joseph said, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, he was acknowledging their wrong and his hurt without creating more hurt. Only a healed person could do this. Only someone who had forgiven could do this. Joseph chose forgiveness over payback. And we see that in the moment he had the greatest opportunity for revenge. Somewhere between being sold into slavery and being reunited with his brothers, Joseph did the hard work of giving his hurt to God and allowing God to be the center of his healing. That's why Joseph was quick to acknowledge God in the area where his brothers had caused him the most pain. It didn't make what his brothers did okay. Hear me out. It didn't make Joseph's pain any less. It didn't make the pain go away. It just took the real pain and the real hurt and no longer put them on center stage. It put God on center stage instead. And that made forgiveness possible. Forgiveness was not only for his brothers. It was freedom from his own pain too. Joseph went on to tell his brothers to go get their father and move the entire family to Egypt because the famine would continue and without making this move, his family would suffer and starve. And then we have this verse in chapter 45, verse 15. It says, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. It's a pretty simple verse, but that may be the only thing that's better than payback. And that's reconciliation. That's what we see in that verse. This is where we see God do the impossible in a relationship. Bring peace when there has been only hurt and pain. All because of the power of forgiveness. When it comes to other people hurting us, we too have the opportunity to choose something better than payback. In fact, here's a really simple way to remember it. When you don't know what to do, pursue peace instead of payback. When you pursue peace, you fight for the relationship. In other words, you can fight to win, to be right, to make a point, or you can fight the urge for payback and pursue peace, but you can't do both. Joseph preserved his relationship with all of his brothers and his family because he chose peace. And he was only able to do that because he fought for forgiveness. And he was only able to forgive with the help of God. Joseph didn't have a superpower that allowed him to do this. He just had the determination to do the work that peace requires and an understanding of God at work in his situation, which means you and I can do this too. When you pursue peace, you lay down your right to get payback. You let go of revenge. You say goodbye to your desire to get even. Instead, you choose the path of forgiveness. You choose God's story of reconciliation instead of your own story of payback and revenge. This is easier said than done and something you may have to work on daily, but the ultimate benefit is for you. You not only have peace with them, you have peace within yourself. Here's why this gets complicated. Because what happened to you isn't what happened to Joseph. In fact, I could tell dozens of stories none of them would be exactly like yours. Maybe you've spent the whole time wondering, do you always have to reconcile? What about when it's toxic? What if you're the one who did the hurting? Those are good questions. Each of us have unique and complicated situations and figuring out what it looks like to pursue peace in each circumstance isn't easy. That's why your small group and your family and your Christian friends are so, so important. We want you to talk about what this looks like for you 
in your real life, with your real friends, and with your real family. This week, I want you to think about what you have the power to do when it comes to pursuing peace. What do you need to decide? Who do you need to forgive? What offense do you need to bring to God? He can do incredible things in your story that you may not be able to imagine yet. I've seen him do it in my own life. So when you don't know what to do, pursue peace instead of payback. Thanks for being with me tonight. I really appreciate it. I'm praying for you guys. I'm rooting for you. And Jesus loves you. Bye.